Welcome to Bitcoin Stuff. <laughs> oh my god, you guys, I cannot wait to tell you what I have got for you this evening on Night of the Cult Members. Now, the first cult member we're going to talk about is uh, Tom Busby. And the first thing you notice about him is that it is very easy to get him to talk. The cult members have a, uh, a need to bring you over to their side. They believe they can do this with enough propaganda. Uh, so this conversation kind of swerved in from a totally different conversation. Uh, but what I'm basically saying here is that uh, investors can be open-minded to other teams of programmers who make uh, forks of Bitcoin and uh, who have a vision closer to what the investors want. So he comes at me with uh, absolute certainty that he is going to convince me over to his side as long as I listen enough. And he tells me that uh, that I have, a, I have a poor idea. My ideas are poor, so I'd better go over to where he is. And he says that um, I need both technical knowledge and economic knowledge in order to make a wise investment decisions or else I'm flying blind. However, I would argue that um, it is possible to to make investment decisions based on what you know, even if you don't know everything. And you can make your decisions in a way that attempts to control for what you don't know. So like an index fund is like an attempt to control for everything. You're just going along with the entire rest of the economy. But I would say that I can make decisions based on my economic knowledge and and make them in a way that protects me from my lack of knowledge elsewhere. Okay, so that's why it's a good idea for me to be diversified between the forks of Bitcoin because uh, I am I am less interested in technical issues and more interested in economic issues, and I I am fine. And I would also argue that if we used a prediction market to determine how Bitcoin was going to scale, both sources of information would be integrated intelligently. Okay, so if there was a different investor who knew about technical issues and didn't know about economic issues and we were interacting in the prediction market, the most valuable predictions that would come out of this market would be uh, the most profitable union of our two ideas. So that's kind of what's good about the prediction market, is that it lets, uh, it lets many different people with, with many different sources of information and many different states of ignorance all interact with one another, and produce a harmonious result. So notice how I'm not really trying to convert him over to my side. I'm just kind of like uh, just saying my opinion. I'm not, I'm not putting too much effort into this discussion, and this is something that you can do with cult members. You can make them put all of the effort in. Because Rem remember, they believe that if you receive enough propaganda, you will come over to their side. And they need everybody on their side. Uh, and their ego is tied up in the idea that people need the, the information that they're selling. Okay, And if they see somebody who doesn't need the information that they have, then that, that touches them at their egos. Okay, So they really want to... Uh, want to convert you. So all you have to do is kind of sit there and not not get excited with them. They they believe that what they're doing will be effective. So they are going to uh, wear themselves out with excitement that you will never respond to. And eventually they will get that you're not responding to them and that is uh, that's when you can have more of a genuine interaction. I like his response at the bottom here. I think I think that the way he says that sounds kind of like he is uh, trying to tell me that I'm not really saying anything, so I think that's a little bit snotty. That's a reformulation of my point. But, um, but it's more important to come to agreement in arguments than to disagreement. You, you have to, to find the, the maximal 
agreement, I, I would say that if both sides have a good understanding of where you agree, then in order in order to have that understanding, you need to understand the other person's point of view fairly well. So what he says next is that uh, the core chain is like Betamax and the cache chain is like uh, VHS. And it looks like he's saying the opposite, but I think he just uh, made a mistake here. Or maybe he is a very, very sophisticated troll and that was his real message all along. Uh, we'll never know. But uh, I think he's saying that the cache chain is like VHS. It's the inferior technology, and he is worried about VHS becoming the standard, even though it is the inferior technology. Now, at this point, uh, Fork Jester jumps in and asks, uh, do, you, do you remember why VHS won? And I think that's a really good point, because uh, as investors, all, all you can really do is make predictions. Okay, that's really um, that's really your only move in 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 the Bitcoin game, and so so an investor who predicted that Betamax was going to win because it is the superior technology would be wrong. Okay, uh, and you have to be right if you're an investor. So the reasons that one thing wins out over another are not necessarily the ones that you consider important. And as an investor, you have to figure out what genuinely is important. Okay? And Fork Jester is kind of like my minion, and he is someone who uh, truly has no agenda other than to amuse himself at your expense. So if he asks a question like this, he has no particular reason ever to answer it for you, and he doesn't care if you figure out the answer. He will just um, continue to do, do whatever, whatever amuses him at the moment. So Tom Busby makes the mistake of responding to Fork Jester as would any good cult member he is trying to make the point that uh, because of this example of VHS winning out over Betamax, that is evidence that the market is inferior to the ideas of technocrats. And so uh, Fork Jester repeats the question because uh, you know what what actually matters in the real world is the market, uh, regardless of the opinions of technocrats. So Tom Busby decides to play along, and he says that VHS won because the porn industry adopted it. And then he repeats the point that this is why he doesn't like markets. And um, if you are an investor, you can't just say, I don't like markets. So then Fork Jester shows him one of those GIFs that looks like it's a loading GIF forever, but nothing ever loads. And this is kind of what it's like to talk to Fork Jester. So he is really, um, really telling Tom Busby what, what the conversation with him is going to be like here. So I think that that's uh, quite merciful of him. You'd think someone would figure out to stop talking at this point, but uh, no, he keeps on going. Finally, Fork Jester shows him the pooping rhino gif, thus clearly signaling the direction this conversation is going to take. So you see what I mean? We, we are really talking about someone who truly does not understand that what he is trying is not going to work. So I tried to help Tom out here and kind of explain to him that uh, when somebody posts a rhino pooping at you, that means you can stop talking to him. And I love his response. I can stop talking to him whenever I want. See, kind of like a like an addict. That's what it's like being a, a cult member. You're addicted to uh, drawing more, more people into the cult. He says that's what the block button is for. So he has no settings between propaganda and block. But I can try to have a good faith discussion as far as it remains possible. Sometimes that means ignoring the childish bullshit. Notice which he has not done. He has not ignored the childish bullshit. He has continued talking. And 
you know, the GIF means that the entire conversation is bullshit. Okay, it's not just a uh, a free floating rhino. It is truly a a strong signal of of poor communication to come. So a uh, fantastic response from Tom Busby to Fork Jester's um, next comment. That's a complete misunderstanding of my point. I suspect a willful one. Very good, Tom Busby. Very good. And as we can see here, uh, Tom Busby finally did block Fork Jester. But I noticed something interesting here. It seems like Tom Busby is using Rimmer from Red Dwarf as his avatar. That's a complete misunderstanding of my point. I suspect a willful one. I mean, you can totally imagine Rimmer saying this. So one thing that happens when you're in a cult is that you are primed to have negative interactions with people on the outside. So you're kind of trained to be at your most annoying when you're talking to people on the outside. Uh, so that may explain the, uh, the apparent Rimmer impression here. And, and this is one of the ways that they, they keep you in, right? Because if you have negative a interactions with people on the outside, then, then you don't want to go outside, right? Okay, next conversation is with uh, Jorge Timon. And uh, he is a co-author on the Sidechain's white paper. So just uh, keep that in mind as you uh, see how this conversation unfolds. But he is asking a question about DriveChain. And he says... So as a full node user, how do I know if a pegout TX on the main chain is valid or not? And um, the whole idea of drive chain is that the validity of the pegout transaction is simply an ordinary Bitcoin transaction. So there is nothing, nothing more that you need to do in order to verify that it is valid. Okay, so when you send your coins onto the drive chain, you are taking your own risk. That is the entire idea of drive chain. And um, as we will see in this, this conversation, Jorge fails to understand the answer, no matter how many times I repeat it. So first I say, it's just an ordinary Bitcoin TX, and the responsibility is entirely on the drive chain itself to maintain its own definition of validity. From the perspective of a full node, you can pretend drive chains don't even exist. Okay, so that is exactly what I just told you. And Jorge's response is, but there must be some condition for the peg coins to be claimed, no? Or can anyone take them? So, so the answer is that there is a condition, but it is undefined. Okay, you define it when you make the drive chain. So the condition could be really stupid, okay, because it's your responsibility, see? So, so yes, there is a condition, but there is also nothing to say about it a priori, okay? So I say, yeah, but that is decided when an individual drive chain is created and the full nodes don't have to care about it in any case. And so Jorge says, and what would those conditions be? So he has had the question answered twice, and he still fails to grasp the idea that uh, we are leaving the responsibility up to somebody else. And and what would those conditions be? Like, And so I, I answer, anything they wanted. So then he says, uh, who is they? The creators of the sidechain? Okay, let's say that's you. What would you put there? What, how, like the whole question is pointless because what I put in there doesn't have anything to do with what anyone else would put in there. I mean, he doesn't understand the concept of anything, okay? Like anything can go in there. That's the whole point. Anything goes there. If you're on the main chain, you just don't care. You don't care if it doesn't work out. It's their responsibility. That's the whole idea. Like, he doesn't understand abstract thought. That's kind of what the problem is here. Because abstract thought, that means that you uh, leave you leave some some parts blank. So I'm starting to get really annoyed with him at this point, and I'm just like, uh, what difference does it make? So cult cult members always think that uh, you have to stand up to their scrutiny. So one thing you can do with cult members is don't try to live up to their standards. So any time they ask you to sort of uh, account for yourself, just don't. Just pretend like 
you didn't even notice that they were asking. So that's kind of what I do here. He says, it is what is going to secure the drive chain. No, it is what secures the other two types of side chains. I thought drive chains were precisely another proposal for what to put there. If that's not defined, I don't understand what drive chains are even proposing to add to Bitcoin. And you notice that Alphonse Pace and uh, J.W. Weatherman, both cult members, liked this tweet. And Paul Stork also liked this tweet. And that is because Paul realizes that Jorge is exposing his ignorance to any thinking person here. And uh, the cult members also like the tweet because they don't understand that, that Jorge is uh, displaying his ignorance here. So I told him that he doesn't need to understand because I was pretty much done with him at that, at that point. I was kind of like, uh, don't need any more ammunition now. And so here Jorge says, that's what I'm saying. It's not that developers are ignoring the proposal. It is that you guys don't care about devs understanding the proposal, dot, dot, dot. So, so when, when he objects here that we are making things difficult for him, uh, I, I would argue that he is making things difficult for us. And he is too stupid to be involved in Bitcoin development. And so I gave him another chance here. And I said, what do you think is the value of a blank sheet of paper? And um, so then, then he suggests that I am changing the topic. Uh, and I tell him that it is not a change in topic. And you said you don't understand the value that drive chain adds. I ask you to explain the value of a blank sheet of paper. I would argue that if you are unable to, then you are incapable of understanding the answer to your own question. Anyway, I probably could have been a little nicer to him here, but um, just talking to him was just awful. He just felt like just the densest person that you could imagine. So then he said, thank you for explaining. Now I can explain others that the security model of drive chains is the same as that of a blank sheet of paper. None. So, so basically, he only values the security that he can provide to other people. That's the only thing that he thinks is valuable. He doesn't think a blank sheet of paper is valuable because it is something that somebody else can put whatever they want on. So he is, um, he's a lot like Jeremy Bentham, as he does not value creativity. He thinks that his overarching system should be in control of everything. And uh, there is no reason for anybody to ever leave his panopticon. So Jorge is incapable of understanding the value of not being crushed in his loving embrace, which is completely devoid of abstract thought. Okay, so see, he doesn't value creativity. And he does not uh, understand the value that is added by uh, removing your responsibility and allowing other people to be responsible for themselves. So he's saying, you haven't made the idea sufficiently clear to us, Paul. Why won't you make it clear to me? Why can't you explain it? This is a guy who doesn't understand the concept of a blink. I bet if you were to show him this segment of the video, he would still believe that he came off better between the two of us. What I think is funny about this is how he's kind of sitting here in the position of a gatekeeper, kind of looking down at Paul, uh, not showing any awareness that he may have uh, demonstrated some kind of a disqualifier for the role of gatekeeper in the course of the conversation. Now, there's nothing more normal in, in Bitcoin than for completely clueless people to pretend to be experts. So uh, you just have to be ready to deal with this kind of thing when you're in Bitcoin. It's really nothing to worry about. So this next section begins where I ask J.W. Weatherman to tell me uh, the perfect tweet that will explain how Segwit2x is an attack. And uh, J.W. Weatherman is uh, like this ghost who kind of follows me around on Twitter desperate for attention and uh, he thinks that I'm a very suspicious character so uh, he pays a lot of attention to me so I decided to throw him a bone here and uh, let him talk to me my, my, my point here is that Segwit2x can only succeed by creating value right because investors would have to choose it over the core chain okay so it would create value when when people made the transition because otherwise they wouldn't do it. 
Say SegWit2x comes out. Now there are two alternatives. There's one in which the core chain is the main chain, and one in which the SegWit2x chain is the main chain. I would argue that the alternative most likely to arise is the one with the greater total value. Okay, so if the SegWit2x chain becomes the main chain, then that would mean that uh, it is more valuable for SegWit2x to be the main chain than it is for the core chain to be the main chain. And I would argue that if you want to call it an attack, then it was not a successful attack if it doesn't become the main chain. You know what's interesting is that nobody even mentioned replay protection in this entire discussion. So, uh, so I, won't even, I won't even bother thinking about that for the purposes of this argument. So you basically have an attack with SegWit2x that is successful if it creates value. Kind of absurd to call it an attack. So I arranged the answers in order from least interesting to most interesting. So we start with LuckDragon69. Anything designed to split the network is an attack as it creates marketplace confusion. Now as to that, it is impossible to have a market without confusion. So if any sort of marketplace confusion is an attack, um, I think we're doomed. The damage done is opportunity cost to those who chose poorly. Doubly so when greed incentivizes arbitrage trading and speculative attacks. It's not like there's anything good about people who choose wisely getting richer. Maybe if that happened, people who chose poorly wouldn't have such a big effect on the economy. So obviously this is a completely lightweight response. And uh, my response is to say, I don't think I like your security model because it depends more on protecting stupid people than providing opportunities for intelligent people. I would like a different security model in which SegWit2x is not defined as an attack. And my point down there is that you can't really defend against an attack that creates value, can you? If something is creating value, people are just going to do it. They're just going to move towards it. It's not like you can stop them. So if you say that something which creates value is an attack on Bitcoin, then uh, you are saying that Bitcoin is doomed. Uh, nothing else uh, interesting happened in this thread, though. The next response is from J.W. Weatherman himself. And remember, according to him, this is the perfect tweet to explain in what sense SegWit2x is an attack. By introducing dangerously large blocks, SegWit2x could have led to minor centralization. This would make physical attacks upon Bitcoin very easy. And then he plugs his website. Well, to me, it sounds like these two kinds of problems take care of themselves, right? Because he's saying that the miners will centralize and then people will physically attack the miners because they're in a central location. Well, then they won't be centralized anymore, will they? I guess he could be saying that you attack and you take over the mining rigs. I was imagining that you destroy the physical mining rigs in the attack, but maybe there's a central location and you take it over without uh, hurting them, and then you become the centralized miner. So I guess my answer to this is that all miners have to produce valuable information, and proof of work does not automatically make something valuable. See, because I can, I can make stupid information, and I can put proof of work on it, that still doesn't make it valuable. That just means I've wasted a lot of energy. And if you are censoring transactions or whatever, and you're a miner, you're producing less valuable information. So I would say no matter the, what the composition of the miners is, they have to keep producing valuable information or they are vulnerable. So if a group of miners is not distributed enough and as a result they are not producing valuable information, then a more distributed group of miners could start mining their own chain which would become the more valuable one. So I decided to focus in on the weasel words uh, could have in there. He's basically concerned trolling there because he's saying he's talking about a threat, but uh, not saying, saying anything that would make the odds of the threat above zero. To me, uh, risking minor centralization is not something that you always 
want to avoid, okay? Because maybe bigger blocks are a way to increase Bitcoin's value, okay? And so then maybe you do want to take a risk, okay? It's not an attack to change how you want to take your risks. So what I said was, I don't think it counts as an attack to just change how risky you want to be and what you want to be risky about. And of course, if Segwit2x were to win, it would win because investors chose it. And his response is just the absolute worst. So first of all, don't claim to have a high income because now I can just waste your time by asking you to prove it. Like I'm making the big bucks. Oh yeah, prove it. And you look stupid if you don't, but you look stupider if you do because it certainly wouldn't change my real opinion of you if you actually were. So then he says, I have a lot of experience defining what constitutes an attack. So he didn't, uh, didn't really get my hint in the last tweet that I kind of want to decide what, what an attack is, okay? Uh, but uh, no, he, he wants to do it. He is uh, the experienced professional here, so I should probably just uh, defer to his judgment. And he references the, uh, the opinions of all the security pros he's ever worked with. They sound like great people to me who uh, probably know what they're doing. And then he accuses me of playing dumb. Uh, so good job there. God, I mean, <laughs> I can't believe this guy is for real. Great response from uh, Christoph Atlas there, by the way. So I want to quick discuss this response from George Vaccaro here. He's saying that a small cabal of CEOs were trying to prove they could change Bitcoin without consensus. Okay, so my response to this is that if you propose to change Bitcoin's rules, you are not changing Bitcoin's rules. Okay, so you create a fork of Bitcoin that, that does not, that is a proposal. Okay, does not change Bitcoin unless the investors decide they like it and they decide to buy it okay so if the fork becomes the most valuable chain then that is a change to bitcoin's rules but it's not a change to bitcoin's rules when it is proposed and and that is when when the chain first starts running so it doesn't matter that there was a small cabal of ceos that created it the choice is made in the market after the fork is turned on and and that is that is the point that i make below i say if it won that would just prove that investors like it. So it would be the new consensus. Some idiot below says, uh, no, it wouldn't have proved that. Only proved that the majority of the network is vulnerable to such attacks. Attacks in which an evil cabal of CEOs offer the Bitcoin investors an option. You know you're in a cult when it's considered an attack to uh, offer people options. And now on to the most interesting answer of the evening, and that was from... Luke Dash Jr., definitely the most important person we've talked to yet on cult member conversations. Now, this was my first interaction with Luke Dash Jr., so uh, I was pretty excited. Didn't want to do anything that might annoy him. Remember, he is the most important person we've talked to yet on cult member conversations. And actually, everybody says that he really thinks his own way. Paul says that uh, he understands drive chain along with Adam Back, so that's really good. And uh, everybody says that he engages in arguments rather than in personal attacks. So I don't know if it's even really appropriate to call him a cult member. I don't know what you would call him. So, uh, so I've got to make sure that there's nothing I could possibly do that would annoy him later. That was kind of, that was kind of what I was thinking when I was having this conversation need to make sure I can win him over on my side. So I decided to go check out his Twitter account just to see what I could learn about him. So I see that he's cast uh, Roger Ver as uh, Darth Vader here, and uh, he has cast himself as young Obi-Wan, I think. And uh, Gavin appears to be on the Evil Empire as well. Uh, Craig Wright is uh, the emperor. Well, I don't think that's appropriate. 
Not really sure who Greg Maxwell is supposed to be over there. Uh, but uh, this looks good to me. This looks really good because we can see that, like me, he suffers from severe autism. So, uh, so I know how to win over autistic people. This is going to be no problem. So let's take a look at some of his, uh, some of his tweets here. Abortion is a heinous crime, worse than the Holocaust. It is insane that we as a society tolerate it under any circumstances. Uh, which is totally true, of course. I uh, totally agree with that, obviously. Um, and here he has uh, tweeted out a Bible verse that says, um, Do not be so confident of forgiveness that you add sin to sin. Do not say, His mercy is great. He will forgive the multitude of my sins. For both mercy and wrath are with him, and his anger will rest on sinners. Well, I would never do something like that, so that's good. But hopefully he's not going to be too put off by the video I made where I read from uh, Paradise Lost and uh, invite the listener to identify with Satan and, uh, and accept the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The last will and testament of King Louis XVI, written shortly before his death, and the end of France's greatness. Huh, that's interesting. Oh, dang it, he's a Catholic. Catholics hate Protestants, and Paradise Lost is a Protestant book. I wonder how much of the Summa Theologiae he's read. Huh. So if you were to combine uh, Richard Stallman with a Catholic, maybe that's what Luke Dash Jr. would be like. Well, after you've been in Bitcoin for a while, you realize that this kind of absolute freak is exactly the sort of person you meet in Bitcoin every single day. So there's really nothing wrong, nothing, there's really nothing abnormal about anything that we've seen here. Um, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, how do I win him over to my side? And I thought, uh, maybe flattery? I mean, I do want him on my side because he's probably the greatest genius Bitcoin has ever seen. But then I thought, maybe I should neg him a bit first, because he's probably, probably used to flattery. The only thing is, could I make it obvious enough that he would notice? I mean, given that he is a sufferer of autism. But then I remembered that everyone says that he sticks to the arguments and does not engage in personal attacks. So that's what I decided to do. And I just had to hope that I would not accidentally insult or offend him in any way. Or that if I did, he would realize that I too suffer from severe autism and would understand it to be purely the result of a complete lack of understanding of human social dynamics. So you notice I didn't try to power game him, I just stuck to the Socratic method. And uh, the Socratic method is very effective at winning people over to your side. Remember earlier when I said it was important to find agreement with people? The Socratic method is kind of like that, except you have to do all of the work. The Socratic method allows you to show the other person the boundaries of where you agree and disagree, and that makes it so he can't avoid engaging with your ideas. Its, it's power comes from, from its open-mindedness. So if you are able to use the Socratic method, that means you are able to uh, bridge two different bodies of ideas. And I think the, the, uh, the power of the investor comes from being open-minded too. Okay, so you have to have two, two different ideas in your mind, and um, you have to be able to, to understand the idea of the person that you're talking to, and then you also have to have the idea that, that you think is the correct one, and uh, you kind of um, let, let the other person tell you his ideas, and then you ask questions that kind of uh, relate his idea to your idea. In order to answer your questions, the other person has to understand your idea. So you have to ask questions that can't be answered correctly unless he understands your idea. So you, you ask in a way where uh, engaging with the question at all requires him to learn about your idea. And remember, the power of the Socratic method comes from open-mindedness. So you have to be uh, genuinely open-minded to the other person's idea. And you have to genuinely engage with the idea in order to construct good questions.
So I think the Bitcoin investors should be open-minded to anybody who forks Bitcoin as people who can potentially add value. Um, but at the same time, you, you have to focus on his engaging with your idea. Okay, so that's kind of why you might have to ask the same question kind of over and over because I'm trying to teach you my idea. So we have to learn first, first thing first. So if you want somebody else to engage in, in your idea, you have to stick to the basics until he's got the basics down. Okay, so the Socratic method um, is both a teacher and learner at the same time. You have to be, you have to be both in order for it to be effective because you, you really have to go along with whatever the other person gives you and that could be could be anything. And Luke Dash Jr. definitely had the most interesting answers to, to the questions that I ask here on Cult Member Conversations. The, these are really some, some mind-blowing answers here. Remember, this is the best possible tweet to explain in what sense Segwit2x is an attack. He says, Light wallets when not paired with a full node the user runs himself, are vulnerable to being fed invalid blocks. 2x would have been an altcoin forming its blocks specifically to take advantage of this vulnerability such that it fools such wallets into thinking it is Bitcoin. Huh. Segwit 2x would have been an altcoin that tricked light wallets into thinking it was Bitcoin. This is definitely a weird answer. You, you see what's weird about it? Well, first of all, it looks like a very good answer because it sticks to technical stuff. And I like this, uh, this detail here. When not paired with a full node, the user runs himself. But it leaves some important things out. And it's kind of mind-bending to think how you would construct an answer like this, mentioning them at all. Light wallets. You know why he mentioned light wallets? Because light wallets don't verify that a block has a particular size. They only look at the block headers. And you know what would make a light wallet think that the Segwit2x chain was the Bitcoin chain? Without, because it had a higher cumulative proof of work than the core chain. Because the light client can read proof of work. It can check proof of work on the headers. And it's going to choose the header with the higher cumulative proof of work. So the light clients aren't fooled by Segwit2x until Segwit2x actually manages to get the higher cumulative proof of work. Then the light wallet will think, for some reason, that this header is a Bitcoin header. So that is how you exploit the vulnerability in the light wallet, is you... Uh, you exploit its innocent presumption that the chain with the highest cumulative proof of work is the real Bitcoin. This is definitely the answer of a true believer. And you can't sustainably put proof of work in a coin if it's not valuable, because the investors buy it, and then it becomes more valuable to mine. So, he's talking about a situation in which Segwit2x adds value. So I asked him, what is the definition of Bitcoin? Because I know that that's going to lead to some interesting answers. He didn't answer this one. But uh, Mark DW answered, and he said, uh, Bitcoin Core is Bitcoin. And Luke Dash Jr. corrected him. No, that is Bitcoin Core, an implementation of Bitcoin. It isn't the same thing as Bitcoin. And Mark DW says, you mean the reference implementation and de facto specification? Yep, that's the one. And Luke Dash Jr. responds, it's no longer a reference implementation, and it is de facto specification only because it has a monopoly. Oh, okay. Now, as you know, I define Bitcoin in terms of investment actions. So if you bought Bitcoin before the forks happen, that's the investment action that I call Bitcoin. So now you have uh, cash and core and some other stuff. This is where it would have been leading Luke Jr. if he had more time to do the Socratic method with him. But uh, it's, a, it's okay if you don't get very far with it. But if you think about this definition for a bit, it's easy to see why investors and developers are opposed to one another. Because if one of these coins is acting like it's trying to suppress the others, 
then it's destroying a lot of potential for the Bitcoin investors. So if you treat it like an attack, you're defeating yourself. Let's go back to this conversation here. 2X was designed as an attack. An attack designed to trick light wallets into mistaking the chain with the highest cumulative proof of work with the real Bitcoin. These are some very difficult attacks that these core devs have to deal with. Thank goodness that they're there protecting us all. Protecting us from attacks that make Bitcoin more valuable. So I was, I was telling Brian Lockhart here that uh, if a fork of Bitcoin is a threat, wouldn't that just mean Bitcoin is doomed according, according to uh, what he thinks is a threat? So Luke Jess Jr. says, if you want to make an altcoin, you can do so without designing it specifically to attack Bitcoin users. So um, this genius cryptographer here doesn't get the point that his crypto system doesn't know how to respond to the attack that I'm talking about. Okay, he doesn't even get the question. He's just saying you shouldn't attack us. Okay, you should make an altcoin without attacking Bitcoin users. So I said, uh, I think of it more as a proposal to change the rules of Bitcoin that any investor can take part in. So he didn't respond to that either. So here I'm saying if Segwit2x had won in the market, then it would be the new consensus. And Luke Dash Jr. says, no, it wouldn't have proved that. Only proved that the majority of the network is vulnerable to such attacks. Bitcoin sure is in an adversarial environment now. There's so much you have to worry about. What if I were to send a transaction into the Bitcoin network and it got mined into the Segwit2x chain, but not the real Bitcoin chain, and some light wallet were to assume it was the real Bitcoin transaction merely because it was on the chain with the highest cumulative proof of work? The very chain that any reasonable person would normally assume was the real Bitcoin. So I say if Segwit2x were to win, it could only have done so by being more valuable than the core chain. Do you agree with that? And Luke Dash Jr. says, Not in the slightest. If 2x were to win, it would have done so by fraud, by people accepting 2x coins without realizing that they weren't bitcoins. So I tried to ask him to define bitcoin again. Bitcoin is defined by its consensus rules. Huh. Certainly feel enlightened by this one. I think the Luke Dash Jr. program has gone into an infinite loop here. So in the event that Segwit2x had a higher value than the core chain, it still wouldn't have Bitcoin's consensus rules. And if it had more proof of work than the core chain, it still wouldn't have Bitcoin's consensus rules. Because it's still considered an attack on light wallets. I'm glad Luke Dash Jr. is there to protect my light wallets, which are not paired with a full node the user controls for mistaking the chain with the highest cumulative proof of work for the real Bitcoin, whatever that is. Certainly has nothing to do with Bitcoin Core, which is merely an implementation of Bitcoin that has a monopoly. You have to really be able to think ahead when you're a cryptographic thinker like him. It would never have occurred to me to say something like, uh, what if a bunch of malicious Bitcoin investors were to form a consensus on a chain of Bitcoin which maliciously didn't implement the correct consensus rules of Bitcoin? And what if my light wallets, which were not paired to a full node the user controls implementing Bitcoin's real consensus rules, which Bitcoin Core has a monopoly on, were to confuse the chain with the highest cumulative proof of work with the real Bitcoin? That sounds terrible! It's probably the only choice that makes any economic or game-theoretic sense whatsoever. So, how are we going to protect light wallets from making it? Now, I remember at this point there was someone talking to me who wanted me to uh, oppose Luke Jr. more strongly here for his circular reasoning. But really what you want to do is, is let people take, take you where they want you to go when you start seeing uh, craziness. Really what you want to do is see how far people will go before they realize that they're crazy. You don't, you don't want to oppose people because then they won't give you information so easily. And if you oppose people, you can't encourage creative thought, which is what you have to do if you want to entice somebody out of a cult. See, because they're not going to experience as much creative thought inside the cult. So... If that happens while they're talking to you, that's going to be something that they will uh, will remember. So I asked him why Segwit2x's rules are incorrect consensus rules. And he said they fail to enforce the 4 megabyte weight limit. Thank you, Mr. Dogmatism.
So I asked him why that's incorrect. He decided to stop answering at this point. Let's talk about trolling, since Luke Jr. calls me a troll. He doesn't seem too concerned about it. However, trolling can destroy cults. If you're a good enough troll, you can teach people to be an independent thinker. Because cult members have a need to convert you. They need to pay attention to people who don't, uh, who aren't converted, right? So that's how you troll them. You, you play on that need. Maybe he's just saying it to warn people, or maybe he's just saying it. I have identified you as a troll, but that's just going to draw attention to me. And then I can play in that need to be, uh, be converted even more. And then I can keep asking questions that simultaneously teach people to think like me and reveal information that's of interest to the market. And I said, well, we can disagree about the security model of Bitcoin, right? So that would mean we would disagree on what constitutes an attack. And Luke Dash Jr. says, not really. You can describe a different security model, but that would no longer be Bitcoin security model, dot, dot, dot. And I say, why not? Everyone else could just agree with me and follow it. So here's another point where Luke Dash Jr. decided he was done talking to me. And there you go. That was Night of the Cult Members. Hope you enjoyed watching. Uh, I don't think I'll have to do any more of these. But we'll see.